Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. The Justice Department announced today that it will investigate the spike in harassment, intimidation, and violent threats against school board members across the country. Now, for months, school board meetings have devolved into screaming matches with fury-fueled rants and even physical fights with raging parents. Down. We, we know who we you know are. Who you are. We know we who know you are. are. You, you can leave we freely, who you are. but we you, will find you, and we know you who you are. You will never be allowed in public again. Get real. Stand up. Face the facts, guys. This is happening. We need to get up. Stand up. I will be disrespectful however I want. You do not get to tell me what how I get to act. But I guess if we're to follow the logic of this board, I assume Rosa Parks should have just taken a seat in the back of the bus. Fists are now flying, all of this on live television. Fists are flying. Now we can see the sheriff's deputies are coming out here to get between the two groups. In recent months, adults across the country have taken to throwing tantrums like the children they say they're looking out for. The federal government is now stepping in. In a memo released today, Attorney General Merrick Garland wrote in part, in recent months there has been a disturbing spike in harassment, intimidation, and threats of violence against school administrators, board members, teachers, and staff who participate in the vital work of running our nation's public schools. The move comes less than a week after the National School Boards Association requested federal help in dealing with rising number of threats made against the educators. Police have been called to school board meetings in countless states. School board members outside Columbus, Ohio, received threatening letters that started with, we're coming for you. Not surprisingly, this has led board members to resign over fears for their safety. Now, let me be clear. Debating something like mask mandates is a legitimate issue. And this is different from the political questions of governors, for example, in nine states who've tried prohibiting mask mandates in, in classrooms. There are also other hot topics on the agendas. But we're not just talking about raised voices. In August, a Tennessee school board meeting devolved into a horror show as an angry mob descended on health care workers who'd asked the board to reinstate its school mask mandate. That same month, a Kansas woman went on a rant about COVID-19 being a lie and the vaccine being a bioweapon before trying to intimidate her local government into blocking a mask mandate. Nothing can stop what is coming. You vote yes, you will all be tried for crimes against humanity. Hundreds of clips from these meetings can be seen on YouTube, Facebook, etc. Watching them can often feel like you're in an alternative universe, as was mocked on Saturday Night Live this weekend. Hello, my name is Jane Nordling Smythe. I am concerned and I'm also crazy. Let's begin. <laughs> the Johnson Johnson and Johnson are from because of Fauci, okay? Look, I support dissent, including vigorous dissent, on an important debate about masks and other issues related to our kids. I get it. But what is it about this that is so much more infuriating than other, let's say, vaccine mandates or in schools or other requirements from schools or the government? Some of the angry folks say the confrontational meetings are a result of a disconnect between school boards and parents. Others say there's no need for the federal government to step in. Well, joining me now to discuss is Dan Rash. He was one of the three school board members in Okanoma, Okanoma Walk, Wisconsin, to resign, citing the toxic behavior and the hyperpartisan environment within the board. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. Uh, I appreciate it. All right, first, let me ask you, what has changed? I've got to believe that school board meetings can get heated, right? People disagree. What have you seen that was so different now than you saw, I don't know, four or five years ago? Yeah, uh, thank you, Dan, for having me on. I really appreciate that. Um, without question, it's, it's that rhetoric. It's clearly hostile, uh, the anger in the voice. Uh, the accusations that that we don't care, you know, we're public servants, we're elected, uh, we're looking out for every student, but yet um, the, the current groups that are being organized to attend, um, they heckle, they shout, uh, they interrupt. Um, 
they have a target um, on us. They want their way, and there's no compromise to it. So I have to ask, though, threats are a different story, right? The Fed stepping in is a big deal. Some people are going to say, you know, why can't local officials deal with this kind of stuff? Um, this is more, I assume, than just people yelling, right? Very much so. I mean, um, our resignation, I just want to be clear, Dan, it wasn't because of the hostility towards us. Um, I have a correct, correctional background, so I've been through that type of rhetoric. Um, but what we need to do is to help notify our community to what is going on within our school boards. This is a new behavior. Um, what you've shown on camera is happening. That is happening within our school boards. Um, at the beginning of this, um, we there was an organized protest to block our entry into the building. Um, we received a, um, a media post that one of the people was going to be carrying um, as we attempted to enter the building. So the local law enforcement was called. The group was um, mushered onto the sidewalk and the threat was investigated. Um, but this is definitely at a higher level um, than just that dissent or disagreement. Um, there's a no holes barred, one way, one solution without empathy or compromise, um, looking at all kids. And the communities so, have so to, to know to, that this is what's going on. So, so to be clear, you think that the national organization asking for help from the federal government was necessary? Yes, yes. Yeah, there, there has to be some, some protection here for school boards where, you know, we, you may get a stipend, but um, when, when the focus is off of the children now and it, it's focus, it becomes centered around an object like masks or my First Amendment rights or my Second Amendment rights, that's taken a different tone. And I don't believe um, our community alone can deal with that. We need help. Mm -hmm. Well, look, and it, it seems that the attorney general is now taking this seriously. And I have to say that, you know, I've heard uh, some say, well, you know, th why is the federal government getting involved here? You know, what would be the purpose of that? And I think that when you see what's happening nationwide, at least investigating this on the part of the Justice Department uh, makes sense uh, to me. Dan Rash, thank you so much for coming on the show and uh, sharing your perspective. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Dan. Coming up, a boxer dies in a state-sanctioned fight. But should he have ever been allowed to fight in the ring in the first place? So-called state regulators sure seem to be choosing profit over safety. And new developments in the Gabby Petito case, the lawyer for Brian Laundrie's family now changing up the timeline on when they last saw Brian. This is Brian Laundrie's sister distances herself from her parents. And just when you thought the political climate couldn't get weirder, Taylor Swift's battle over her music, now a major issue in the race for governor in Virginia. Could Swifties actually sway the election? I just said Swifties. We'll take a closer look at all this bad blood, which is apparently a song that she sings. Coming up. Boxing's back in the news this week as the biggest fight of the year is just days away with Tyson Fury defending the heavyweight championship against Deontay Wilder. But there's a darker underbelly of the sport that's come under increasing scrutiny today following the death of a Mississippi fighter on Monday. On August 20th, Justin Thornton was knocked out in the first round of a bare knuckle boxing match in a fight in Biloxi, Mississippi. A knockout blow sent him crashing headfirst to the canvas where he laid motionless. He spent the last six weeks paralyzed and ultimately died from his injuries. This was a sanctioned, yes, state-sanctioned bout. But how was Justin Thornton ever permitted to fight in the first place? A closer look at his record 
offer strong evidence that he should never have been allowed to fight on that day. Thornton, who was 38 years old, competed not just in boxing, but in mixed martial arts as well. And in his last five fights, he was knocked out in the very first round in all five. And in three of the five, Thornton didn't even last a minute. He hadn't won a mixed martial arts fight in five years. Lifetime record was 6-18. and 18. In combat sports, fighters must be licensed ahead of time by the State Athletic Commission where the match is taking place. In this case, in Mississippi, there are no uniform rules across all jurisdictions. There's no national commission. So a fighter that is not deemed to be fit in one state may be cleared in another. High-profile example of that happened recently with former heavyweight champion Evander Holyfield. California regulators refused to approve a fight involving the 58-year-old last month owing to what it called his diminished skills. But Florida, hey, they granted Holyfield a license to fight against Vitor Belfort in, on September 11th and about for which Donald Trump served as a guest commentator. What happened? The result was sadly predictable. The former champ was stopped in the first round, but not before absorbing a series of punishing blows from an opponent nearly two decades his junior. Last December, a novelty match between 50-something boxing legends Mike Tyson and Roy Jones became one of the most lucrative events in boxing history, generating more than 80 million in pay-per-view revenue alone. Tax revenues off a fight like that provide plenty of incentive for a state regulatory body to sanction it, even if there are questions, even if it's dangerous, even if it's life-threatening. The Tyson-Jones fight began the trend of other aging boxers looking to cash in on their notoriety. In addition to Holyfield, boxing icons Oscar De La Hoya and Riddick Bowe are among those looking to make a, quote, comeback. And it is abundantly clear at this point that right now, no one in power is going to stop them. The government's taken countless measures in the past two years to protect public health in a whole variety of ways. Often they're measures taken to protect people from themselves in sports, like the kinds of helmets or padding that can or should be worn. But not here. Justin Thornton, in my view, needed someone to save him from himself. Even his sister knew it. She wrote on Facebook, we wish he had given up a long time ago, but he died doing what he loved. He knew what could happen. But why are safety regulations that are demanded in other sports completely ignored when it comes to boxing? Let me repeat this again. This is state sanctioned. And in Justin's case, it sure seems like it was pretty close to a state sanctioned homicide. Joining us now is one of the biggest promoters in all of boxing, Lou DiBella. He's promoted fights involving boxing greats like Bernard Hopkins and Deontay Wilder, who's headlining the big fight in Vegas. Lou, thanks very much uh, for coming on the show. Appreciate it. We saw your tweet from last night about this, and this is what caught our attention. You paid tribute to Justin Thornton, and then you blasted the system that failed him. You said, quote, this fatal night was his sixth consecutive first round stoppage. The state of combat sports regulation in America is atrocious. Talk to us about why you think that's happening. I mean, state regulation is completely unacceptable right now in its current form. Um, part of the problem, Dan, is that we don't have any federal guidelines that the states have to meet minimally. So it's up to each individual state how they regulate combat sports. And by the way, this isn't simply boxing. His last five fights were not boxing matches. They were MMA. But it doesn't matter. Knockouts are concussive events. He suffered five concussive events in five consecutive fights. And he was licensed by the state of Mississippi basically to show up and get concussed and knocked out again. This time, he didn't survive it. It's unconscionable. It's barbaric. Um, it's, it's barbaric that there's not a health and safety um, database where where people are, are designated as being unsafe, where one state will honor another state's um, banning of a fighter for health and safety reasons. You know, you mentioned earlier Holyfield. I actually think that because it was technically an exhibition, the referee jumped in before any real serious blows were landed, thank God. But should that event ever have been sanctioned after New York said no and California said no? California said no, New York said no quietly, which is why it didn't take place in New York. 58-year-old um, ex-fighter. Let me ask you, hey, hey Lou, L let me ask you a question. You're a promoter, right? You're a boxing promoter, and you're taking this position, which I think is going to surprise some people. 
why as a guy who promotes boxing would you be calling for this kind of regulation? Because I'm a human being. Because allowing guys like Thornton, who are warriors, not protecting them from themselves in a combat sport, in a sport that's largely not regulated, with no singular kind of administrative body or governance. You know, we're basically the wild west of sports. It's one of the things that's always made us sort of attractive. It's like a, a guilty pleasure for a lot of people. I fell in love with boxing in the days of Ali when I was a kid. You know, and, and, and people love boxing, and frankly, boxing does save lives. The problem is in its unregulated state, it takes them away too easily. You know, I lost a fighter named Patrick Day, who, who died after a, a, a world-televised event in October of, it was uh, right before the pandemic, October of, 19, of, of 2019. He was properly CAT scanned. He had a, a, a loss in a fight. He sat out for a while. He, he, he was a world-class fighter. He, he was tested thoroughly, and he still died after an accident, you know, a, a, a tough fight in the ring. Combat sports are very unforgiving. When we do everything right, they're still dangerous. When we do everything right, there's still an assumption of risk. But, but Thornton should be alive. Justin Thornton should be alive. That fight never should have been sanctioned. Nowhere in the world, nowhere in the United States. This is, this is 2021. We're living in a, in a world of the, of, of the internet and... and the World Wide Web and information flow is instant, and we can't protect guys like Justin Thornton from themselves. Yep. We just lost Blue, an 18 you... year old girl. Dan, we lost an 18 year old girl in Canada um, named Jeanette Zacharias Zapata. She, she was just turned 18. Her, her husband was a fighter. Yeah. She was a fighter. She had lost a couple of fights in a row. She was put in a fight in Canada after being knocked unconscious in Mexico where there's virtually no, Mex no regulation. And she went up to Canada. It turns out that she had a, probably had a brain bleed in her previous fight and was told by doctors in Mexico not to fight again. That information never found yeah. its way to Canada. These kind of things Lou, Lou, this is this is Look, yeah. I, I, I apologize that I got to wrap this up, but, but it's important stuff uh, that you're talking about here. And I think that a lot of people had no idea. Because uh, I'll tell you, I had little idea about this. And... Your tweet and your speaking out, I think, is making a, a big difference here. And I hope uh, that it will have an impact. So there isn't another situation with a Justin Thornton. But I'm afraid, as you say, there will be another one uh, before this sort of regulation um, ever happens. Lou, thank you. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you for putting a, a light on this. Coming up, deputies ambushed by an AK-47 wielding suspect after a car chase that reached speeds of more than 100 miles an hour. Sean Six Larkin joins us live to take us through the explosive dash cam video coming up. Now, I know this is going to sound nuts because that was my first reaction, but apparently in the Virginia gubernatorial election, former Governor Terry McAuliffe has hit on an issue that he thinks could push him back into the governor's mansion. Taylor Swift. Earlier today, the McAuliffe campaign launched a series of attack ads on social media highlighting his opponent's role in the controversial 2019 purchase of Swift's master recordings. I had no idea that the buyout of Swift's masters had been such a sore spot for the singer and her fans, but it is. And now it's a potential liability in a race which many had considered a bellwether for the 2022 midterms. Last year, Glenn Youngkin, McAuliffe's Republican opponent, retired as the co-CEO of the Carlisle Group. It's a private equity firm that worked with media executive Scooter Braun to take control of all of Swift's master recordings. For a time, Braun refused to sell the recordings back to Swift, leading her to re-record them on her own. Swift eventually called on Carlisle to intervene, writing on Tumblr the purchase of the masters allowed Braun to control, quote, a woman who didn't want to be associated with them in perpetuity. The ads include images of Swift and Yunkin, along with the hashtag, we stand with Taylor, a popular way for fans to show support throughout Swift's legal battle with Braun. Now, this race is a dead heat. And I've long believed that celebrity political endorsements are basically irrelevant these days. But this isn't an endorsement. It's a negative ad. And in theory, those work. Now, I have no idea if it will, because while I think I like Taylor Swift, I can't name a single song of hers off the top of my head. So are these fans so rab rabid that they could actually make a difference, or will they just shake it off. 
Okay, that was a song reference that came from my producer, Adam, and not from me. Joining me now to discuss is Jen Oswad. He covers the music industry for Variety and has written for a number of other publications. Jen, thanks for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right. I mean, are Taylor Swift's fans so rabid, so angry about this, that it could actually impact the outcome in Virginia? Um, I'm inclined to doubt it. Uh, I'm sorry, I was laughing at your shake, shake it off reference there. Um, I'm very much inclined to doubt it. But when a race is in a dead heat, you just pick up and throw whatever's handy. And it happens to be Taylor Swift in this case. You know, it's, a, it's something that could rile up some voters. Um, you know, his connection, to, his actual connection to Taylor Swift is really pretty distant. Um, yes, he was involved right. in that sale. Yes, he was working with Scooter Braun, who's Taylor Swift's arch enemy. But, you know, he's no longer with the firm, and that, that firm no longer even owns the Masters. They've sold them. So it's a little bit of a stretch, but, hey, whatever works. So, but how angry currently are Taylor Swift's fans? And I only ask that to assess, like, you know, how much action is it, could this actually lead to? And when I heard this story, I said, come on, you, this can't be for real. I mean, but are they really this angry about it that, they're, that, this, that it could actually galvanize them? Well, one thing you can't do is underestimate super fans, okay? Taylor Swift fans are lethal. <laughs> Not literally, but, you know, when they swarm, it gets ugly. And they were all over Scooter Braun when that deal went down. And Taylor, to be fair, because she really wanted her masters, um, and apparently made a very reasonable bid for them, uh, riled them up. That's not something she usually does. Um, so they could have some impact, a big one. We'll see. But as you said, it's a very tight race, so anything's possible. All right, Jim, I, I would find it to be amazing if the, the postmortem on this race becomes, you know, they look at all the numbers and the exit polling and this and that. Well, you know, it was the Taylor Swift fans who really blew this thing out of the water. Who knows? Jim, thank you for taking the time. Really appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. And like I said, anything's possible. The Taylor Swift effect. Anything is possible. Anything is possible. You can get a reality show beco a star becoming president. Who knows? Coming up, you said a man <laughs> fires an AK-47. <laughs> a man fires an AK-47 at police, wounding three officers. But if it hadn't been for heroic action, more innocent lives almost certainly could have been put in danger. Retired Tulsa Police Lieutenant Sean Six Larkin is here to talk about the explosive video live coming up. Time for our police cam segment showing you the dangers law enforcement officers face every day. We're taking a look today at an ambush in Georgia. <laughs> Now, it started with police chasing a Nissan in Carrollton, west of Atlanta, with speeds topping out at over 110 miles an hour. Two cousins, Pierre and Aaron Shelton, were in the car and started firing at the officers. They shot Sergeant Rob Holloway in the head. Two deputies heard the shots and joined the chase. The suspects crashed in some woods near an elementary school and shot a second officer, Chase Gordy, in the shoulder and leg. When Corporal Jameson Trout and Deputy Jay Rapetto went to look for the suspects, Pierre Shelton was standing in the road and shot at them with an AK-47. The deputies returned fire, killing them. Now we paused the video prior to the fatal shots being fired. Aaron Shelton was the driver. He was arrested and has been indicted on 16 counts by a grand jury, including six counts of aggravated assault on a police officer. He's in jail awaiting trial. Miraculously, Sergeant Holloway, who was shot in the head, was able to walk out of rehab and is recovering at home. And Officer Gordy was released from the hospital a day after being shot. Deputy Rapetto, shot in the arm, has more therapy scheduled before he can return to work. Corporal Trout was not injured. Joining us live to take us through this unbelievable video is former Tulsa Police Lieutenant Sean Sticks Larkin. Sean, great to have you, you back. This is the sort of thing you simply cannot train for. 
No, that's exactly it. You know, this pursuit started literally over a speeding vehicle. And, you know, it's something I have said numerous times. People don't run from the police for speeding. They don't run from the police because they don't have a driver's license. There's always some other reason that they run from officers. In this case, you've got a guy with a rifle. Um, as you mentioned, you know, uh, shots are fired during the course of the pursuit, an officer crashes. You end up having a total of four different law enforcement agencies that get involved in this because when something like that happens, there's a tone out that goes out to all the agencies around, hey, we need help, send everybody you have. Um, and it took four different agencies to get this guy, uh, you know, eliminate him as a threat and get his cousin in custody. Right, but the, the, the brazen nature of, of what he did there is, is just, it's so stunning to see it. And I think, look, I think it's important to see it, right? Because this is every officer's worst nightmare is, is what we're seeing it here. Is. Um, and, yeah, absolutely. Ahead, yeah. And, and, and sorry to cut you off, Dan. And, and that's exactly what stands out here. This guy's running from the police. Uh, they're out in a rural area at five o'clock in the morning and he's already injured now two officers, one during the pursuit and the, uh, the other officer that's down there. His cousin has fled into the woods. This guy has an opportunity. He could flee. He could even jump into the other uh, deputy's vehicle there and take off. But he stands there and waits and watches the police car drive up by itself with its lights on. And then he engages them right there in the middle of the road. And that's about as brazen as it can get. Um, another thing I want to point out, you know, the, the rifle this guy has during the first half of my career, we, I, you know, I was in the gang unit. We chase violent felons. We chase gangbangers that have guns all the time. We might catch one or two guys a year with one of those. The latter half of my career, so many bad guys have their hands on these, you know, these large rifles like this, and it's something we were finding all the time. These kinds of rifles, meaning in, in what period of time are you talking about where you suddenly started to see this kind of uh, weapon much more prevalent? You know, I, I started uh, as a police officer in 1997 and 2008 when I went into the gang unit. And I would say probably by 2010 or so is when it just started becoming a regular basis. We were finding them on car stops. We were finding them on search warrants. Uh, you know, I know right now in Tulsa, we have had numerous shootings and homicides that are involved in, uh, you know, these large caliber rounds from rifles. Yeah. And real quick, Sean, I think some people don't think sometimes about what it's like to have been an officer who had to shoot and kill someone. It doesn't happen very often. Officers don't have nope. to do it very often, but it also does end up becoming a very significant event in their lives. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and listen, every single officer handles those type of situations differently afterwards. Um, you know, there's a video that came out recently this year where an officer was involved in a shooting and had to shoot a female in a car that was shooting. And soon as he shot her, he broke down crying. Um, you know, and, and even though it's 100% justified, you just don't know how you're going to react. And so that's why it's very, very important that departments, um, you know, have those peer support systems for officers that are involved in these type of deals. Sean Larkin, as always, thank you, appreciate it. And once again, we are just so relieved to hear that these officers are all okay. The fact that there was an officer shot in the head who is fully recovering is just astounding and such a relief. Um, it is just, you know, when we were deciding whether to do this, you know, I was, I was saying I wanted to know what the outcome was and, and I was just so relieved when I heard that. So Sean, um, thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. And you don't know what he did or didn't do, but you do know that he came home without her and yes. didn't tell anybody. It's infuriating. We deserve answers. That, that was Gabby Petito's family desperate for answers. All this is Brian Laundrie's family attorney puts a new date out there for when Brian's parents last saw their son. What is going on here? We're going to break it down coming up next. There is a lot of news to report in the Gabby Petito case tonight. It's related to dates and times and the laundry family attorney. But first, let's start with Gabby's family. Her parents and step-parents spoke to Dr. Phil about their questions for the family of Brian Laundry. And you don't know what he did or didn't do, but you do know that he came home without her and yes. didn't tell anybody. It's infuriating. We deserve answers. You do know, at least his parents have said, he did come home. None of you saw him in the house, but you know his parents said he came home. 
Well, the, the van had to get there somehow. He That's right. He, he, the van got there, and whatever happened with his parents after that, I don't know. But we can only speculate. We don't know. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. And to be honest with you, they probably wouldn't tell the truth to begin with. So whatever. Joe and Nicole both called Roberta, yeah. asking. If, Not just. Called yeah, and text. text. Roberta, I need the phone number I get for that family. Phone, I, there was uh, there was a couple numbers for the Police mom. Police officers called her. Detectives called her. But you all called. Yes. Oh, we called. You called. Yes. You called. You called. I can't tell you how many times. She called. She, she called. He, 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 called. Called. he called. And what was what did you get? No response. Voicemail. Nothing. Voicemail. This is the Laundry family attorney Stephen Bertolino is changing the timeline a bit, saying today that Laundry's parents now believe the last time they saw their son was on September 13th. They initially told the police they hadn't seen him since Tuesday the 14th. We are also now hearing more from Brian Laundrie's sister, Cassie. She's distancing herself from her parents, saying she's not sure if they were involved in Brian's disappearance and that she has been cooperating with law enforcement. No, I do not know where Brian is. I'd turn him in. I worry about him. I hope he's okay. And then I'm angry and I don't know what to think. I would tell my brother to just come forward and get us out of this horrible mess. I've been cooperating with the police since day one. I have been in touch with law enforcement. I don't know if my parents are involved. I think if they are, then they should come clean. Cassie's had protesters outside her home, and she actually had a conversation with them uh, last night at that home. Um, and she says about the Laundry's family lawyer, Stephen Bertolino, that he told her parents not to communicate with her about the case. Your own parents are not talking to you for what reason? They just... The lawyer said not. Whose lawyer? Their, their, their parents' lawyer. lawyer. Their we lawyers. Lawyer. We have nothing to hide. We're also learning more about Brian Laundrie's whereabouts in August. The attorney, Bertolino, confirmed today that Brian flew home to Florida from Salt Lake City on August 17th and back on August 23rd to rejoin Gabby. The last date she was seen alive was on August 27th. Now, that incident between Gabby and Brian where police were called, and there's that video of it, was on August the 12th. Bertolino says Brian flew home to obtain some items and empty and closed the couple's storage unit to save money. He also confirms the couple paid for the flights together as they were sharing expenses. A few points I want to make clear. It is not strange that Brian Laundrie's attorney would advise his client not to talk now. It was strange to me when he advised that while also claiming he hoped that Gabby was found so she could be returned with her family, if she was just missing, and if Brian and the attorney were hoping she was found, one would think that Brian could just help. But I believe that the attorney knew when he sent out that first statement on September 14th, he knew that they were not gonna find Gabby alive. I also find it odd that an attorney would be telling Brian Laundrie's parents not to talk to Cassie Laundrie about Brian unless, of course, they know something that attorney Bertolino does not want them to disclose. Because remember, as a legal matter, they could have helped Brian all they wanted until that arrest warrant was issued on September 22nd. Then the legal side of this changes. If it was before the arrest warrant was issued and he was just a person of interest, as long as they didn't specifically lie to the authorities or send them on a wild goose chase, then there's no criminal liability for them. So with that in mind, what are they hiding? Why would their lawyer tell them not to talk to their daughter if they don't know anything? Obviously, a lot to unpack. Let's check in with criminal defense attorney David Katz. David, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. All right, do you think that I am being unfair to attorney Stephen Bertolino here? Well, I think the first thing is that all of us feel a huge amount of sympathy um, for the family of Gabby Petito. And we can certainly understand why they sometimes speak in anger um, and out of this feeling of, of grief uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I guess rage that they feel. And I certainly understand why Dr. Phil and why you and responsible journalists are covering what the um, parents of Gabby have to say and what the sister of uh, Brian Laundrie have to say. But at the end of the day, I think that the attorney um, was representing the parents. And I think that he gave the parents of Brian Laundrie good advice. And I think that advice would have been don't speak to other people about the case. That would include also don't speak to your daughter 
about the case. So that to me is not surprising. And the two things that well, you pointed out. Let me ask out, you about I, that. Let me, let, me, sure. let me ask you about that first, though. If you're saying that he shouldn't talk about the case, that would presume then that they know something, right? Would you at least agree with me that it's fair to deduct from that, that they obviously must know something that he does not want them to share with Cassie for, or others for fear that it could either get them in trouble legally, in trouble with the court of public opinion, whatever the court is, they obviously must know something more than we know about them knowing. Well, re respectfully, Dan, I think that um, there's that old game of telephone where once you tell somebody something, they have a misrecollection. So let's assume the sister says something that misrecollects the conversation with her parents and a prosecutor wants to turn it against the parents. I think that as the attorney for the parents, he didn't want to see his uh, clients get in that situation where somebody says that some statement could be used by a zealous prosecutor to charge them with aiding and abetting a fugitive or someone who was going to be a fugitive or helping someone but, obstruct but, justice. But that's why I drew the line. But that's why I drew the line about the arrest warrant, right? Because before the arrest warrant, there was no potential criminal liability for the parents unless they were lying, right? Meaning the only criminal liability they have is the potential of, you know, unless there's something else we don't know about, but, but, but based on what we know, the only potential criminal liability comes at the moment there's an arrest warrant. And at that point, yes, you're right. Then they could be potentially charged with harboring a fugitive, whatever the case may be. But everything before that point, well, in theory, there's no legal liability, and yet their lawyer is issuing these statements talking about how he hopes that they are able to find uh, Gabby as part of this, and yet clearly advising Brian, as he says he did, not to talk, and this is a separate issue. But again, I was troubled by this idea when she was missing that the lawyer is saying, I'm advising him not to help. I get that when someone is under arrest or where someone, a body has been found, but when they're looking for the body, that suggests to me his lawyer knows they're gonna find her dead. Well, Dan, I mean, if it was so obvious that the lawyer knew I think everyone would have told the lawyer, don't issue that statement. I think I haven't seen any evidence that the lawyer knew at the time. You're assuming that the client somehow, because he apparently also represented uh, Brian, uh, that Brian had told yeah. him that uh, she, something had happened to her, something untoward, that he had done something. I mean, for all we know, Brian's story was and is going to be that they had a fight. She met another guy. The guy was really nice to her. She went off with that guy. He said, oh, my God, that leaves me in the lurch. He hitchhiked back to the van. He said, what am I supposed to well, do now? I guess I'm going to go back okay. to Florida. But, right. I mean, but if, he spent the thousand dollars. He spent the thousand dollars down. He spent the thousand dollars because they were going to share expenses. And here he is traveling but back by himself to Florida and needing to buy I mean, that, gas. That's a Look. You've created a great defense there, except that's not the story he told because he wouldn't help at all. He wouldn't help at all. He didn't help the police. That's a terrific defense to lay out in court. And if he'd said that, I would be having a serious conversation about it and say, okay, I get it. But that's not what he said. He just didn't help at all. And he said, oh, I don't know. We're just hoping, we understand there's a search going on and we hope that it works out. That's what the lawyer said. And I've advised my client not to talk. He didn't say we had a fight. He didn't say she walked away. He didn't say she went with another guy. That's a great defense that an attorney may make up, but it's not what, what actually happened in the case so far. Take a final word. I've got uh, 20 seconds. Well, Dan, as I say, uh, we all feel a lot of sympathy for everyone in this case. It may be that the Laundries are going to lose their son to federal prison for the rest of his life if he's not dead already. But I think the thing that we also need to focus on is that the police didn't make an arrest down there in Northport, Florida. If he was so obviously guilty and if the parents knew he was so obviously guilty, what are they supposed to think from the fact that the parents don't even detain or arrest him with the quantum of evidence that I get they it. had? It's very him? easy. I I, look, I get the, the police is a separate issue. It's a nice way to deflect the attention. But, you know, this is why you're a good defense attorney. David Katz, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Um, former White House Press Secretary Stephanie Grisham on CNN. And somehow CNN and Grisham make a perfect pair. It's earned a respite in tonight's Mediate Moments coming up. Time now for our Media Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and the bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Former Trump communications director and press secretary Stephanie Grisham is out hawking her new book. She's turned on the former president, and now she says she feels responsible for her actions. Do you feel that you played a role in hurting democracy? Um, 
I do. Do you think your enabling cost lives? I do. Um, I think the way we handled COVID was, was tragic. But it wasn't all about taking responsibility when CNN's Brianna Keeler inevitably shifted the focus away from her role in making decisions and crafting messages to CNN's favorite target, Fox News. What was the role of Fox News in the White House? I think they're disseminating it to a lot of people who uh, went, went to the Capitol for January 6th. And I, you know, again, I've had a lot of time to grapple with this and I feel horribly guilty about, about my part in it because I was on Fox a lot. So wait, Fox is to blame for disseminating her rhetoric to its audience? And she's naming names? I looked forward to going and, and doing Lou Dobbs because Lou Dobbs would do all the talking about how great everything was and I would just nod and, and say yes. Um, they, you know, by and large, didn't get tough with us. They just took what we were saying and disseminated it. That may be an accurate statement about Lou Dobbs, but she says she would just nod and say yes. Like, for example, if the issue was, of, I don't know, a former Trump official writing a book came up. Uh, John Bolton, uh, mm -hmm. the president's former national security advisor, writing a book, a tell all, if you will. I've never heard of such a thing. No one that I know, who I know, has ever heard of it. What a rancid, corrupt, absolutely disgusting move for him to have made. I agree with him. And you know, how much does it cost to, to sell out potential national security in your country? You can't make this stuff up. John Bolton's a sellout. I'm out of time. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.